Hello, welcome to Travel Guide, Episode 8. We're going to do Part 2 of our foundation check based on uh, Hebrews 6, 1-3. to Really glad you tuned in. Pray and hope that it benefits you. As always, I want to thank the Travel Log Network for hosting Travel Guide. I encourage you to check out the affiliated shows with uh, Travel Log and the Chameleon Church. On Mondays, you can join the live broadcast or watch any time of... Uh, a deep dive into Alan Aguirre's book, This Thing is Spiritual. It's a 22-week series uh, that looks at the Holy Spirit, navigating the spiritual, the prophetic, worship. Uh, it's great for artisans. It's great for anybody who's a worshiper and uh, really been enjoying it. Tuesday mornings, you can watch live or anytime on the Facebook or YouTube channels for Chameleon Church. We have the Chameleon Church Show giving you biblical anecdotes for the modern man with your host, Alan Aguirre, and co-hosts Lenny Parada and Chris Rosentrader. Monday through Friday, we have Incorruptible, the two-minute warning. Monday through Thursday, two-minute segments where we go through topics, or uh, right now they're doing Book of Bible, First John. It's really good. And uh, on Friday, there's a longer episode where Alan unpacks everything and brings it all together. We have a Shabbat Oak conference, that's Pentecost for uh, some. Uh, coming up at the end of May in Lehigh, Utah. Check out the chameleonchurch.com website for more details. Hope you can be there. Uh, this year's theme is on hearing the voice of God. It's a wonderful time of community and teaching. And as always, encourage you to check out Acacia Grove Press. Acacia is in the biblical tree. It's a uh, Great place for books, for resources, for the best biblical calendar out there on the market, in my opinion, and planner. Uh, mugs, it's got it all. Check it out. Uh, so with that said, let's move into episode eight, Foundation Check. You don't need to have seen part one, but I encourage you to do so because it's all part and parcel. Last time we talked about the foundation that is laid out as elementary, described in Hebrews 1, 6, 1 to 3. We developed a punch list, as it were, to inspect our foundations of faith, to make sure nothing is missing or in need of a repair or attention, and to stir ourselves up by way of reminder, like Peter said in 2 Peter 1, 13. In the previous episode, we reviewed repentance from dead work, dead works, sorry, faith toward God, and the baptisms, John's baptism, Christian baptism, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We continue on now with the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and the eternal judgment. Again, notice the progression here. We turn away from sin, we put our faith in God, we become immersed in Him, and we will see using our hands in beautiful and powerful ways until we receive our promised resurrection and hopefully eternal rewards. May we be ever so solid in our foundation by His grace and yielding to the Spirit's leading and equipping. So item four on our checklist, the laying on of hands. So here's a topic that is not all that commonly talked about, let alone treated as foundational. For most of what I call churchianity, uh, laying on of hands is as best tolerated and optional, but it certainly isn't foundational. Seeing how Hebrews 6 1 describes this as the elementary doctrine of Christ, let's start by looking at how Yeshua used his hands, and then all that is written on the topic from there up until this part of Scripture. As we go through uh, the Gospels, we see Yeshua used his hands in several ways. He used them as a primary way to heal, to bless, to perform miracles, to save and restore, to judge, to gather for saving and for destruction, for protecting and keeping, as a marker of authority, and as a symbol of stewardship, approval, empowering and anointing. Before we get into the practical ways that he used his hands, let's look at maybe the 
bigger picture, as it were. Um, let's talk about hands as positional and authority. There are references to Yeshua being glorified to the right hand of the Father. Some examples of this include Matthew 26, 64, Mark 14, 62, Mark 16, 19, and Acts 5, 31. In Mark 10, 35-45, James and John went to Yeshua and asked to be seated at the right and left hand of him in his kingdom. Yeshua, well, let's talk about that for a second. I don't want to gloss over that. What does that mean? To sit at the right hand or the left hand? Well, it's a sign of honor and authority. Yeshua was exalted to the right hand of the Father. This too is an example of the right hand being favored. In the case of James and John, to be at hand was a sign of honor and authority. So there is a connection to being at the hand uh, in terms of authority as well as honor. In the parable of the prodigal son, the father puts a signet ring on the hand of the returned son. Now there's been a lot lately uh, talking in the, in the prophetic world about signet rings. It's kind of cool. Uh, but just to sum up that where we're going with that imagery, a signet ring was a sign of authority and representation on behalf of one who was greater. So, Yeshua also talked a lot about people and things being placed into his hands by the Father. In his hand, we are kept, protected, and sustained. In a reference, Matthew 14, 30-31, John 3, 35, John 10, 28, and John 13, 3. Just as some examples. When Yeshua was on the cross, he cried that into the Father's hands, he committed his spirit. John the baptizer said something interesting too. He said, Yeshua, he, Yeshua, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand. And he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. That's Matthew 3, 11, b to 12. Yeshua also said that he would sort the sheep to his right and the goats to the left. Matthew 25, 31 to 46. In terms of how he used his hands during his incarnation, we see that or maybe we haven't, but we do see that Yeshua's hands were the primary method of healing, of applying healing, even. If you look at passages, and there's a, there's a significant number I'm going to list off here, so get a writing stick handy, but if you look at passages like Matthew 8, 3, uh, and then 8, verses 15 to 16, chapter 9, verses 18 and verses 25, Mark, chapter 1, verses 30 to 31, and verses 41 to 42. Mark 5, 22 to 23. Chapter 7, verses 32 to 35. Chapter 8, 23 to 25. Luke 4, 40. Luke 5, 13. Chapter 8, 54 to 55. 13, 11 to 13. In all those passages, we see Yeshua using his hands to cleanse lepers, to heal the sick, to raise the sick and even the dead, to restore people and mobility, to unstop ears, to open blind eyes, and so on. It is very significant that it was through the laying on of his hands that healings and signs were done. This continued after his ascension when his disciples, filled with and dependent on the Holy Spirit like he was, continued to do healings and miracles through their hands. See Acts 4, 29-30, Acts 5, 12, chapter 9, verses 12, verses 17, chapter 14, verse 3, chapter 19, verse 11. And Acts 28, 8. 
there is something that is a, a supernatural transferring or conferring that happens with the laying on of hands. It is how many of the healings and signs were accomplished. I would add a word of caution here, though. And this is just my personal opinion. I stopped short of making it a matter of doctrine, but maybe just take it as a wiser best, best practice. And that is this. I don't see in Scripture where Yeshua laid hands when casting out demons. He and the others seem to command the unclean spirits to come out. Note Matthew 8, 16. That evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. Also, Mark 9, 25 to 27. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out. And the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. Again, he touches once the mute and deaf spirit leaves. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think there is a spiritual principle here where that transfer can go both ways. So, well, okay, let's look at another example. Now I'm thinking about this. Scripture talks about how a person can become unclean through touching the unclean. And when you think about the encounter uh, with the woman that had the issuance of blood, Yeshua asked who touched him because he felt power go out of him. Now that ended up being a positive and experience, and, and he said that the woman's faith made her well. But he also acknowledged that power went out of him because of the touch. So I would say that it is likely a good idea when ministering, especially in the Holy Spirit, to be very mindful of touching and the circumstances in which you do. Also, to be aware of what I would maybe call a reverse transference. That's just my two cents. Pray about it and consider it for yourself. As always, don't take my word for it. Test everything. But I also do, however, want to emphasize that when it comes to healing, Yeshua and the early followers used their hands to administer healing. Perhaps we become a little bit too hands-off uh, in the exercise of our spiritual gifts. Perhaps this may be an enhancing element of bringing about healing and restoration. Consider Mark 16, 17-20. Yeshua said, And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up serpents with their hands, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. And they will lay their hands on the sick, and they will recover. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached every word, everywhere, while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. Notice the intended use of hands here by believers as Yeshua describes it. There again is a connection with authority, the whole handling snakes thing, but also healing. This can be very powerful when someone is being prayed for or prayed over. When believers in agreement place their hands on or even just toward the person or persons being prayed for, we see in James that he instructs anyone who is sick to have the elders pray and anoint with oil. That's James 5.14. So we anoint and we pray for the one who is sick. Healing and blessing when done in this context can be very powerful. 
And that brings us to the next part. Yeshua used his hands to bless. Now, we're going to cover this in greater detail a couple episodes from now. But for now, let's make note that Yeshua blessed using his hands. Matthew 14, verses 19 to 21. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied, and they took up twelve baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. Matthew 19, verses 13 to 15. Then children were brought to him, that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people, but Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and went away. Mark 10, 16. And he took them, children, in his arms and blessed them, laying hands on them. Luke 24, 50. And he led them out as far as Bethany. And lifting up his hands, he blessed them. As early as Genesis, we see the use of hands in pronouncing blessings. There is also the placing of one's hands under the thighs as a type of oath. The priests would raise their hands and often make a gesture, uh, kind of, where Spock got it from, uh, representing the Hebrew letter Shin while pronouncing the Aaronic blessing. Blessings can be transferred or conferred, maybe if you prefer, through the use of our hands. Benefiting from and initiating blessings to others is a very important but largely lost concept. And as I said, we'll discuss that a couple episodes from now in great detail. But for now, next we see that it is through the laying on of hands that the gift of the Holy Spirit and the gifts from the Holy Spirit can be given. This is this part of laying on of hands uh, didn't occur until after Yeshua ascended because the Holy Spirit was not given until that Shavuot after he ascended, roughly 10 days after he ascended. We do, however, see it as a foundational practice with the earliest disciples. In the scripture, there are instances in which the baptism of the Holy Spirit is received by the laying on of hands, but also where spiritual gifts and prophecy are done so with the laying on of hands. In Acts 8, starting at verse 4, we see that Philip returned to Samaria and preached the gospel there. Many came to faith, so much so that Peter and John were sent to the believers, for they had not yet received the Holy Spirit. Peter and John pray for the believers, and then in verse 17, we read that they laid their hands on them, and the Samaritans received the Holy Spirit. The believers, okay. Uh, further proof that this is a replicable, replicable practice is demonstrated um, in that Simon Magus, Magus sorry, offered the apostles money to be able to administer the gift. Of course, he was rebuked for this, and it was likely tied to his self-glorifying practices in the cult prior to being baptized. But Still, there was an ability to confer the baptism of the Holy Spirit through the laying on of hands. When Paul was in Ephesus, he encountered disciples who did not know about the Holy Spirit and had only received John's baptism. In Acts 19, 5 and 6, we read that these disciples were baptized into the name of Yeshua, and Paul laid his hands on them. And they received the Holy Spirit and began speaking in tongues and prophesying. In 1 Timothy 4.14, Paul tells Timothy not to neglect the gift Timothy had, which was given to him by prophecy when the elders laid their hands on him. Likewise, in 2 Timothy 1.6, Paul mentions to Timothy to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. 
This ties into the final part of laying on of hands, and that is conferring authority, leadership, and or uh, commissioning disciples to missions or positions of leadership. Now we see this in Acts 6, when the apostles laid hands on the deacons selected to serve the Hellenistic widows. In Acts 13, the leadership, prophets and teachers in Antioch, laid their hands on Barnabas and Saul when sending them out at the Holy Spirit's request for the missionary journeys. Paul warns Timothy in 1 Timothy 5.22 not to be hasty in the laying on of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. The process of selecting and appointing elders and deacons involved the laying on of hands. So those who laid hands bore responsibility and had to be wise that they were choosing worthy candidates. It was no mere symbolism or light gesture. Conferring authority and leadership can go back to the patriarch's blessing, Moses conferring his leadership, and so on. Indeed, to be a servant in the manner of a missionary, a deacon, an elder in the body of Messiah is a very heavy undertaking and responsibility. But we should follow this scriptural pattern even today. So we see that as it relates to the elementary doctrine of Messiah, the laying on of hands has to do with healing, blessing, imparting the gift of the Holy Spirit and sometimes the Holy Spirit's gifts and prophecies, and conferring mission, service, leadership, and authority. So let's move on to the next item on our punch list, the resurrection of the dead. Well, the good news is that the resurrection of the dead is fairly straightforward in Scripture. The dead part, maybe not so much. It would really require a separate time to explore what happens when we die. And if I'm being honest, um, I personally don't think it's totally clear, even when we look at it in depth. Frankly, we don't know all, and we don't know for certain what happens exactly when we die. We do best when our understanding, though, is informed by Scripture. But frankly, there are a lot of commonly held beliefs and ideas that aren't in Scripture at all. We don't become angels, for instance, when we die. Uh, I will share briefly some of what Scripture says about death. First, there is an underworld. It's called Sheol, and it's divided into areas. It is important to note that much of what was written in the first century was heavily influenced and informed by First Enoch. The closest we have to this is the Ethiopian version today. In 1 Enoch 22, the angel Raphael shows Enoch four hollow places, deep and wide and very smooth. Raphael states that three of these places have been created for the spirits of the souls of all the dead of the children of men to be brought there. Raphael goes on to explain, that the separations are ones for the spirits of the righteous, one for sinners when they die and are buried, and judgment has not been executed on them in their lifetime, one for the spirits of men who were not righteous but complete in transgression. Maybe you're not entirely comfortable with that, and that's entirely okay. But in the Bible, we read of Sheol, where Jacob said, I think that's the first time it shows up, is when Jacob said he would go down mourning Joseph, and again mourning Benjamin, if Benjamin was not returned to him from Egypt. In the Torah, we read of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Aaron, being gathered to their fathers, or sometimes it's phrased gathered to their people, upon dying, as well as Joshua and his generation. It's described that way in Judges 2. Ezekiel 32 talks, uh, it's really kind of interesting, it's, it's a, a word against Pharaoh, and Ezekiel 32 talks of different parts of Sheol, and there's sections for the uncircumcised, there's those who are warriors, and who are there with their weapons. There is further described within Sheol an area of paradise, and Hades, which, as you can imagine, is not so pleasant. 
In Luke 16, 19 to 31, Yeshua told the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Now, there's contention over whether this is a literal telling or just a story. If you notice, though, Yeshua seems to speak matter-of-factly about the scenario. The poor man is carried to Abraham's side by angels. The rich man is in torment in Hades. He's in flames and asks Abraham to send Lazarus to tip his finger in water and give it to him. Abraham tells the man there is a fixed and impassable chasm between the two parts. Yeshua, when he is on the cross, tells the one thief that very day he would be with Yeshua in paradise. When he rises from the dead, Yeshua in John 17, 21 tells Mary not to cling to him because he has not yet ascended to his father. This was three days after the cross. So paradise was not likely heaven where the throne room of God is. Like I said, this is a much bigger topic. In Jude, we, we see uh, Michael and the devil arguing over the body of Moses. Um, that's, that's not allegory. That's stated as fact. So, I don't want to get too hung up on it, though. We can look at it another time. Regardless, what we do know is that there is a resurrection, and those who are in Messiah will be united with him, being raised incorruptible. This resurrection should be our focus, and not any other anxieties. The people, even before Yeshua, understood that there would be a resurrection, though not everyone shared in that belief. The Sanhedrin were the ruling religious body in Israel and were divided into two main camps, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection and the Sadducees did not. Even during Paul's persecution, this schism persisted and Paul used it to his advantage late into the book of Acts. There was an understanding that the resurrection was twofold. The righteous were raised to reward with God, and the unrighteous raised to punishment and judgment. Yeshua taught this in the Gospels as well. When Lazarus died and Yeshua arrived, he said to Martha that her brother would rise again. Martha said, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Now this is an important part of understanding what the people understood then. The resurrection happens on the last day, or on Judgment Day. Alternatively, some refer to this as the Day of the Lord. But Yeshua responded to her in John 11:25, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? The foundation here is that Yeshua is the resurrection, and everyone who believes in him will be raised. The first century scriptures continue to give us more details and a broader picture of this. Romans 6, 5-11 uh, discusses it, and it tells us that if we have been united with him in his death through baptism, then we will also be united with him in his resurrection. It also goes on to say, now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. 1 Corinthians 15 gives us probably the clearest understanding of the resurrection as it pertains to us and our foundation. When Yeshua died for our sins, according to the scriptures, everything changed even more so when he rose from the dead. Paul refers to believers, post-resurrection of Yeshua, as having fallen asleep because Yeshua says, everyone who believes in me shall live. Yeshua is the first fruits of all us who are to be resurrected. He rose first, then his coming, important part, the dead and Messiah rise next, and then the believers on the earth on that day are transformed, caught up in the air with the rest, and the return of the Lord happens. Amen. Maranatha.
But there is a lot of murkiness and bad doctrine at work today. In the 1800s, Charles Darby, among others, began teaching things different from what's laid out in Scripture. This understanding changes, and what is referred to as the rapture is not the same as what we find in Scripture. There is a teaching that Messiah comes back mysteriously, takes away all the believers so that they don't have to face any tribulation. Uh, it involves these believers mysteriously disappearing. Then Jesus comes back again with everyone, and somehow there are other believers on the earth, but the main crowd comes back with Jesus, and all the talk in Revelation and by the Lord in the Gospels about overcoming, enduring, persevering, and then the rest of Scripture seems moot. Uh, and there's a bunch of uh, darky, creepy movies made about it and books and so on and so on. If you really want to unpack all this and sort it out, I really recommend FAI, Frontier Alliance International, who have a video series taught by Dalton Thomas and Joel Richardson titled The Rapture and the Endurance of the Saints. It's very thorough, it's very biblical, and it's an in-depth treatment of the topic. And it's available on the FAI app or on YouTube. We just can't discuss this at length here and now. So going back to 1 Corinthians 15. Messiah returns at the end and delivers the kingdom to God the Father, and all things are subjected to the Son. When we are resurrected, we receive a new body, an incorruptible one. The body we sow now is a bare kernel of what we will have. We go from being dust-based to heaven based. This happens at the last trumpet. This likely means during a feast of Yom Teruah, which is mistakenly known as Rosh Hashanah today. But the biblical feast happens on the first day of the seventh month of the biblical calendar. And because it is the only feast dependent on being able to see the new moon for the month, it was often referred to as the time when no one knows the day or hour. Research it. The trumpet sounds, the dead and Messiah rise first, and those who remain will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. Death is finally swallowed up in victory. And this is going to bring us to the sixth item on our punch list, the eternal judgment. This is foundational for a couple of reasons. The first, which is not always clear to people, is that there are two parts to the eternal judgment. Starting in Revelation 20, verse 11, the great white throne judgment is described. It says that books, plural, are open. Anyone whose name is not in the book of life is thrown into the fire. But all, great and small, are judged based on what they have done, what is written in the books. Wait, does that mean we're saved by works? No. Yeshua said that whoever believes in him has eternal life. In John 17, 3, we read, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. That is your name in the book of life. But here at the great white throne scene, we also see a time that Yeshua referred to many times in the Gospels. It is a judgment of reward or punishment. When you see him talking in the parables about judging servants, he's talking about this judgment. There are rewards, and, and I should say that these judgments are referred to throughout Scripture too, but... Um, it is a judgment of reward or punishment, and when you see him talking the parables about judging servants, he's talking about that judgment, just so we're clear. Um, there are rewards in his kingdom. Faithfulness and obedience carry rewards and blessings. In the parable of the talents, the good stewards receive more. He also said in Luke 12, words like, this is going to get pretty heavy, but we'll go there. In Luke 12, Yeshua does say words like, Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. He goes on to say, 
Who then is the faithful and wise manager, whom his master will set over his household, to give them their portion of food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. We should also heal, heed the troubling parts of that chapter too. Yeah, more troubling. Luke 12, 47 to 48 says this, And that servant who knew his master's will, but did not get ready or act according to his will, will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrust it much, they will demand the more. Ouch. Hey, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. He is the Almighty God. But the heart and desire of a disciple is to love God most and to love others as we love ourselves. We want to please Him. We love Him with our obedience and faithfulness. Our motivation shouldn't stop at the end of our nose. It shouldn't be self-seeking. Uh, but I still don't want a beating, do you? So make no mistake. It is foundational that we will be judged, and not just for salvation. That is why it's important for us to love and encourage each other, to exercise our gifts for the maturing and building up of the body, not operating merely out of fear of judgment, but earnestly desiring the rewards that come from serving Him in faithful obedience devotion and love so we made it through our punch list how firm is your foundation are there areas that need shoring up are there parts missing or in disrepair how are your foundations supporting you now where you are in your faith how can we help you please let us know let us encourage one another and build one another up as living stones, being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Yeshua our Messiah. 1 Peter 2, 5. And we do that so that we may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness and into His marvelous light. And I do mean that. We'd love to hear from you if we can encourage you. I, I know some of this got a little bit heavy, but that's cool because it's our foundation. And foundation's got to be strong and fortified. There's got to be some weight to them. So that when the storms of life come, and they come for us all, and in various seasons and times, that we can stand with our foundation on the rock, our Messiah, the shield of our salvation. And so, if we can help you, let us know. Really take some time and, and just continue every once in a while to check your foundations and to grow in them, to strengthen them, fortify them. And uh, be sure to reach out to others and do the same. Exercise those gifts. We're all connected together. We are, as Peter said, being built as living stones into a spiritual house. Really want to thank you for tuning in. Uh, the next episode is going to be uh, an interesting one, I think. It's going to be on uh, authority and wielding the authority that's given to us scripturally. And so uh, I hope you'll tune in then. I sure thank you for tuning in on this one. Stay encouraged. Stay in the Word. Stay in fellowship with our friend, the Holy Spirit. God bless you. The views and opinions expressed during our broadcasts are solely those of the broadcast producers, hosts, and or guests, etc., and are not necessarily the views or opinions of the Travelog Network, its sponsors, or affiliates.